showered, powered, and ready to sour. Hey, what's going on, everybody? My name is Chad, and this week's video is brought to you by our lovely Patreons over there at the Manga Club. You guys are fantastic, as well as this week having a very special shout out. Thanks to super fan and super friend Mystery Dago, he actually just wanted to make sure that his buddies in Sugar Tape got a shout out this week. For those of you who don't know, $10 more on the Patreon gets your name shouted out or frankly, whatever message you want. So he paid for this this week. Sugar Tape is a South Jersey hard rock band that I actually happen to like. I listen to myself and I think they have an album coming out if my information is correct. So if you'd like to support the channel or support local music, be sure to look at the link down below. It's their Facebook page and their YouTube page. Thanks, Mystery Dago. Thank you, Patreons. And let's get right into the show. Or at least before we get right into the show, I just want to make sure it's clear. I just got out of the shower. This isn't heat. This is just moisture. I'm not out here walking around like Cat Williams. This is just, this is fresh out the shower. So about every three-ish months or so, I just get fed up with answering the same question over and over and over again, so I have to make a video uh, about something that I wouldn't normally do, but I'm just so sick of typing, and I would rather just link a video. So this week happens to be one of those weeks. Uh, if you have ever asked me, hey Chad, how much X do I need to Y? And I ain't talking about math, I'm talking about, hey Chad, how many words do I need to read this book, or how much vocabulary do I need to understand this movie? I literally can't handle typing that out anymore. It is long, drawn-out answers. It takes way too long for me to do. So instead, if you ever ask me that, I'm gonna link this video here because I'm gonna teach you how to do a little bit of prep work, a little bit of literary criticism, and you're gonna be able to figure out roughly what you need to do to do whatever you need to do. Now obviously those are vague do's that I was saying there, but that's because I haven't taught you guys anything yet, so let's, let's jump right into it. So if you would be so inclined to pick up a Japanese Harry Potter and read through it and go, I wonder if I would be roughly able to read this, or maybe what would I need to know? in order to be able to read this. It might be a challenge, right? Because you're not gonna sit there and try and count every single word through a, you know, however many volumes. I think Japanese Harry Potter has 19 volumes and over a million words, far too much effort. Instead, I'm just gonna show you a little bit of what I do when I try and pick out good reading material. Maybe you guys could utilize the same principles to stop nagging me. I have a list on my phone because I guarantee you I can't do this from memory. So there are essentially four principles that you need to start with when you're analyzing a text to determine a rough estimation of knowledge necessary to begin the journey, shall we say. First one is, do you have the proper kanji knowledge? Uh, the second one is, do you have the proper grammar knowledge? Then, do you have the vocabulary needed? And then finally, do you have the textual analysis skills? Big words, kind of. What do they mean, Chad? How does this help me? I'll only cover the first two briefly because I think they're pretty self-explanatory. The vast majority of everything you're gonna read essentially is encompassed in those 2,000 Joyo kanjis that everyone says you have to learn. It's the stuff that remembering the kanji teaches, it's the stuff that tests up through the N1. It's not all the kanji, but 99% of what you're gonna encounter in your daily lives, in the newspaper, in the vast majority of novels are covered in those kanjis. I personally have a couple circa 1970s commentaries on the early church fathers in Japanese that are like my prized possessions. And to much of anyone's non-surprise, they use kanjis that are extremely archaic. So obviously those Joyo kanjis aren't gonna help you. But my assumption is you guys are not gonna be reading circa 1970s commentaries on early Christian church fathers. And as such, probably not necessary to learn archaic forms. So we're just gonna say roughly the Joyo kanji, which is like the 2000 that pretty much everyone's gonna learn over the span of their Japanese anyways. So that's your first step. Another brief note that I'm gonna throw out here is your grammar. I read a lot. I read roughly about a, a half a manga to a full manga a day and then a chapter of some novel or, or some thesaurus, some textbook, whatever I happen to have. I don't know, I consider that a lot, but I like to read. Over all the time of me reading, even now, the vast majority of every grammar piece is either the stuff that's pretty much covered by the N2 and below, or bleeds a little into the N1. You will see a couple, I won't even call them archaic, but if you read a lot of like period pieces, you'll hear a lot of grammar that you're not gonna cover in the JLPT, and you probably aren't gonna find in like your everyday Japanese grammar dictionary, and that's okay. If it's that special of a circumstance, I don't really expect you to memorize it off the bat or try and find a list to memorize it before you start reading. We can learn those as we go. But just take the time, learn up through the N2 grammar. It, yeah, it's time intensive, but it's really not that hard. And if you forget something, which happens all the time, just whenever you're reading your book, maybe have a grammar dictionary next to you. All right, we've covered that. Now onto the third and, and more than likely the lengthiest part 
of doing actual textual criticism. And that is, how much vocab is necessary, Chad? How much do I need to know to read this? How much do I need to, to know to do that? Now, this is strictly excluding like idioms, metaphors, terms of phrase. So we're just gonna skip it and go straight to actual text criticism. The first misconception that a lot of people have is you'll go, how many words in, like we used Harry Potter earlier, so how many words in Harry Potter? I guess we'll just use Harry Potter the rest of this video. How many words in Harry Potter? And you'll Google that for like a word count and it'll come up at least for the, the Sorcerer Stone, the Philosopher Stone, the first one, like 77-ish thousand words. You might be going, I, I'll never know that many words. And the truth of the matter is, well, about 50% of that 77,000 is the same hundred words. If you don't believe me, I have some data down below to, to talk about this if you guys are interested as well as a Vsauce video if anybody wants it. That's right, about roughly 43% of the total words in, I should say about 50% of all books or anything are the 100 most common words. It's kind of weird, right? You go hundred words makes up 50%. Well, doesn't that mean if I learn those hundred, I can read 50% of books? And the answer is yes, kinda. Because you'll read a book like this, the blankety blank is blank, and the blank does blank. And you go, yeah, I read about half of that sentence, but I don't know what this, I don't, I don't know what the sentence said. So it's not particularly helpful, right? The real question isn't how to look at all those 77,000. It's how do we make that last 50% comprehensible? And the answer is we look up unique words. What is a unique word? All that means is it didn't reoccur in the previous encounter. Meaning if you encounter the word once, that is it, that's the word you learn and then you'll know it for the rest of it. If you look up unique word counts for the Harry Potter books, for C.S. Lewis, for, I don't know, a Jane Goodall documentary, you'll often find that it's, you know, around six to 10,000, which is completely doable. 6,000 is about what people need to test on the end too, right? 10,000 is about what you need to test on the end one. And I figure this is probably why a lot of people say, oh, you just need an N2 to be able to read these books. But hold on there, buckaroo, because you're not accounting for words that are make-believe. Things like muggle, because we're going with Harry Potter. Hippogriff, the golden snitch, quidditch. These are not going to be in a dictionary or any word list that you're going to need to know. They're not going to be on the JLPT because they're make-believe. How wonderful. Because it's make-believe, you're never gonna encounter these in a word list. These are just things you're gonna have to dive into the book to realize. So there's actually a secret number that's here. It's not the unique words that you need to know because there's gonna be a ton that you're not gonna know because they're names of people. They're places that are fictitious. They are fictional concepts that are explained within the book. The real number comes from the amount of words that you need minus the ability, the skill set to read meaning out of the text yourself. Dumb algorithm. But that's okay, I'll walk you guys through it. So, I'm a big fantasy nerd. I'm sure you guys know this, and that's probably why we're using the Harry Potter stuff for the examples this week. This is a excerpt from H.P. Lovecraft's The Call of Cthulhu, Cthulhu, whatever you guys wanna call it, I always get corrected by some part of the fandom, I don't care. I'm gonna read you guys a piece, and he's not gonna give you a word, but he's gonna give you a description of the word, and I want you guys to come up with a mental image. A monster of vaguely anthropoid but with an octopus-like head whose face was a mass of feelers, a scaly, rubbery-looking body, prodigious claws on hind and four feet, and long, narrow wings behind. Do you guys get the, do you get the mental picture? Can you kind of connect that picture to a word, maybe? I'll just, I'll, I'll no, it's fine. Give you a sec. Cthulhu. It's, it's Cthulhu. So here's an instance where you created a mental picture around and without me giving you the word, you guessed what the word was, right? This also goes both ways. They might give you a word and without describing the, like telling you the description of the word, by using it in context, your brains can be able to make a picture around. That being able to make a picture, that being able to frame a view of what the author was writing when he was writing his thing, seeing through his eyes, this is what he's describing, this is how the scene is laid. That is an essential skill to analyzing any text. It's the basis of hermeneutics. It is what we do instinctively as native English readers. I'm assuming you're native English, although I have people all over the world watching this, so I probably shouldn't say that. Either way, we do this all the time. We do it naturally without thinking, but these are skills that aren't reading skills. It's not a number of vocabulary. It is something you only learn by reading. So I kind of lied to you. There's actually a fifth bit besides this textual criticism thing where you're going through and analyzing the text and drawing meaning where the author leaves it blank or up for interpretation. And the fifth part to, hey Chad, how am I gonna be able to know if I can read this? Is you've read a lot before. You read so much that you've garnered a lot of these reading skills. And I would go into depth about a lot of these reading skills because it's not just up in the air, like it's a random reading skill. They're actually defined pretty, pretty well, but that's a whole separate video and I know we're running late because I can see the timer. So we'll save that for another video. But if you have a good comprehension on the Joe Yokanji, if you can understand 
the basics, the foundational grammar, the stuff that goes up to N2, and even then some N2 stuff is like weird and you don't see it a lot, but I'm gonna say, you know, you got most of that and then whatever you see that you don't encounter up to that point, you just have a grammar dictionary just in case. If you're roughly able to meet the unique word quota, not the total word, the unique word quota. And you also have the skill set to draw meaning when it's not given definitive meaning there, or maybe it's not in a dictionary, because I don't know if any Japanese dictionaries gonna have hippogriff. I don't know, maybe. They might have phoenix. I don't know about hippogriff. And you'll know if you have that if you read a lot. It's a language, guys. You gotta use it. And I don't care if you're talking to people. I don't care if you're watching Japanese movies or reading Japanese books. There are skills that are outside of a textbook, far beyond the bounds of whatever study method you're using. And if all you're doing is inputting data, you're never gonna learn those skills. They're only learned by doing. And I think that's where I'd like to leave that this week. Do, do, do. And in fact, do hit that like button. Do comment down below if you have any questions, comments, concerns, or compliments, because I do read all of them. Never be afraid to fail. Never be afraid to try something that looks hard, because you can always put it on a shelf and try it later. I'd like to once again thank all the Patreons from before. Uh, you guys are fantastic. You're why I'm able to do this. And if you would like your name read out, or if you would like to have something that you love or am passionate about sponsored at the beginning of this video, be sure to check out the Patreon link down below. $10 or more gets you precisely that. But even as low as a dollar gets you a handwritten postcard. Because I love you, I care about you, and I like burning money and hot showers. That's about it for this week, you guys. Uh, I will see you on Saturday for another live streamed anime night right here. All right, I think that'll be good. I'm gonna go get to editing this. Love hard, love deep, and I will see you all next week. Bye-bye.